Hey guys, Anastasia here. If you've been watching my channel for quite some time now, you might have picked up my love of art and art history. I absolutely love artists. Impressionists, of course, they're my favorite but I genuinely love artists of all eras. When I was attending my art school as a little girl, every Saturday morning we had the art history classes, which I remember to this day. And on top of that, my mom would buy me a brand new magazine every single week of an artist describing their life's work, their art, and their story. To this day, I love rereading these magazines and I love learning and finding out about new artists. So I thought, why don't I go ahead and create art history chapters in this channel and share them with you. I love learning, so this was just the perfect combination to try and do something new. I hope you guys enjoy this series. This month, I thought, why don't we start with the one and only Kandinsky. As a kid, I just fell in love with his bright colors, geometric shapes, and just the feeling that I would get from his paintings when I would go and see them. And of course, I would hear how much his works would go on auction for, the astronomical amounts that his work would sell for just bedazzled me. So like in 2012, Christie's auctioned Kandinsky Improvisation Number no. 8 for $23 million. Then in 1990, Sotheby sold his fugue for $20.9 million. I mean, you get the picture. So let's dive in and discover this incredible artist. Vasily Kandinsky was born in December 1866 in Moscow, Russia. He was born into a very wealthy, educated family who loved and encouraged his passion for art and they definitely sustained his interest towards art and music, yet in the back of their minds, they always knew that their little kid is going to be a lawyer one day, which is exactly what he agreed to study. He went to University of Moscow School of Law, and he actually graduated with honors in 1892, after which he actually stayed in this university and taught in the faculty of law. That same year, he married Anne. Anne was actually one of the first female students in this University of Moscow. Anne, as a side note, was actually also his cousin. So not cool nowadays. I guess it was 1892 and majority of royals at that time would marry off to their cousins all the time. Anyhow, besides that, the couple did end up getting a divorce 10 years later. The year 1895 was a turning point for a lawyer to completely do a 180 on his career path. This was the year when he decided to go and visit a French Impressionist exhibition in one of the galleries. And he was completely struck by one of Claude Monet's paintings, The Haystacks. That was the turning point for Kandinsky to completely switch gears and head over to Germany to learn art. He went to Munich, which in hindsight was the perfect thing to do as Munich was the epicenter of European art. From 1896 to 1898, he studied at a private art school taught by Anton Asbe, who was a realist painter himself. It was interesting because during these two years, Kandinsky wasn't really focused on learning to be exact, but he was really focused on creating. Right away, we can see the bold colors in a few of his impressionistic paintings. In fact, he chooses the bold colors over the exact and traditional shape and structure of an object. Later on, Kandinsky gets accepted to the Munich Art Academy. One of his teachers was the famous Franz von Stuck. Stuck was super pleased with his new student, yet he noticed that Kandinsky's preference for color and richness of his palette was something that had to be taken away, so he made Kandinsky paint in black and white for one entire year to really study the shape and the structure of the objects. He really wanted him to have that good form. It's interesting to point out, but in these four years that Kandinsky was studying art and figuring out his style and what he liked and what he didn't, we cannot find literally almost no paintings of that period. 
Some may say Kandinsky might have actually destroyed them. Kandinsky finishes his art studies at the age of 35 in 1901. That's around the same time where he starts up a new art association called the Phalanx. It's an association of artists avant-garde. The Phalanx group really opposed the traditional and the conservative ways of painting. The founding members were Vasily Kandinsky, Rolf Nixi, Waldemar Hecker, and William Huskin. Kandinsky was elected president of this association, and they actually decided to found an art school behind the Phalanx. This group lasted for about two years. In these two years, the group organized over 12 exhibitions, which did feature paintings of Claude Monet, Art Nouveau artists, symbolists, and post-impressionists like Paul Signac, Félix Vallotton, and Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Being one of the founders of this group, Kandinsky's name was really put on the map in the art world. Around 1902, the union between Kandinsky and his wife falls apart, and that's around the same time where he meets a young German artist, Gabriel Munter. Gabrielle was an expressionist painter who was well known by her peers as one of the leading artists in the avant-garde movement. Interestingly, they actually meet in the school where Kandinsky is teaching, the Phalanx school. Gabrielle took some classes there. I really wonder if her own personal art style, which is bold and colorful, had something to do with their union because that's exactly what Kandinsky loved. For the next five years, Gabrielle and Kandinsky continue to paint and create, and they actually, in these five years, they move around Europe a lot, showing exhibitions and meeting new artists. Upon returning back to Munich, Germany in 1908, they worked tirelessly on their art. Kandinsky recalls this creating period as one of the most productive periods in his art career. In 1910, Kandinsky decides to make the first series of paintings. In these series, Kandinsky explores abstractism, the depth of art, and he starts conceptualizing what is his style. In the beginning of this period, you can still see the influences of Impressionists on Kandinsky. You can see the bold, rich colors, and you can still see some form and shape to the paintings. However, as time passes, his love of Impressionism and showing it in his paintings starts to dwindle down. He's still keeping the idea of a theme behind his paintings, but slowly he's starting to widen his thoughts on the classical art perspective. When reflecting on his plein airs, he even notes himself that he really just stopped caring about the actual shapes of trees or homes. In a way, he starts painting as if the objects would start singing to him in his paintings. In a way, once he started to paint, he wanted the objects to sing to him with such magnitude that only he could have comprehend. During this time, he also dives in into semi-abstract work. In a way, when we look at the painting of the Cossacks, it was a turning point for Kandinsky to start and explore a new idea of an artistic reality, leading into the abstract movement. In this painting, you see the writing Cossacks symbolizing a conflict in Moscow's 1905 revolution, which in a way parallels the artist's conflict in himself, which is which path is he going to take with his future paintings? At this point in time, Kandinsky really didn't care if the viewer could really figure out what exactly the meaning of each single brush stroke on his painting is such as the three Cossacks with weapons that we can see on the right side, or two more that you can see up on the left upper corner of the painting, or the birds which become a staple in many of his art pieces, symbolizing the tension and the struggle of the piece itself, or what does the rainbow mean, which forms a path or bridge, as you say, to the castle up on the hill. The rainbow itself is a staple in many of his works as well, symbolizing the path to the divine. This painting is really a turning point for Kandinsky because 
it's a melange of the viewer still being able to recognize a few of the pieces in the painting and we can still grasp some reality, yet it's leading into the world of abstract. Kandinsky was very careful to approach the idea of painting in abstract style. Around 1910, he nearly completely abandons the ideas of Impressionist traditional style, like painting concrete examples of the nature. You can still make out the aspects of nature in his work, but it's not easy. Like he always kept saying, I want to give a viewer an opportunity to dive into my work and discover for oneself the inner meaning of it. Now, as we get into 1912, we really start seeing the true period of abstract art that Kandinsky starts to create. It's also interesting to know because Kandinsky loved music and music gave him so much and in a way he just wanted to paint what the music has given him and show it in his work. In a way, he painted the music back. There's a term called synesthesia, which is basically a term that means when one sensory pathway elicits a second one. For example, when we look at a picture of strawberries, we see the picture of strawberries, but in our mind, we could even smell those strawberries or we could even taste the strawberries. And that's something that Kandinsky starts incorporating in his paintings as we relate them back into music. Whenever his paintings were elicited by music, he even started naming his pieces improvisation number whatever, or composition number, etc. Usually the number being a Roman numeral. So this period in Kandinsky's life is called improvisation, composition, or impression. He even said himself, his impressions occurred as a subconscious calling of the realism of the daily living. His improvisations were said to be intuitive and his compositions were based out on carefully thought out and sketched out themes and sketches and drafts. This is the period that we can start calling a Kandinsky style in academia. You guys, that's 18 years into an artist's career. So fellow artists, it's okay not to have your style figured out quite yet. It took 18 years for Kandinsky and he created his first series of paintings 14 years into his work. Even though these masterpieces of 1912 are highly thought of and valued today, unfortunately that wasn't the case back in 1912. Many saw his work as thoughtless rubbish. Kandinsky was defensive of his art, having to explain over and over again what it really meant. Not only had to explain what it was about, but had to prove to others what he was doing was art. He often said, I'm not going to paint music for you. I'm not going to paint my thoughts for you. I just want to create solid, good, necessary, live paintings which will be understood by some. His compositions became tougher and tougher to decipher, and his art critics just couldn't get off his back, claiming that his paintings have become thoughtless and as if he created them on a whim. However, in reality, for a composition number seven, he's created over 30 sketches and prep work in order to make this final piece. As World War I begins, Gabrielle and Kandinsky move to Switzerland. Later on that same year in 1914, Gabrielle and Kandinsky decide to part ways, ending their 10-year union. Gabriella moves back to Germany in Münster, and Kandinsky moves back to Moscow in Russia. The next two years of the artist's life were incredibly tough for him. He barely touches his brushes. One positive thing that does happen to him during this time is that he starts falling in love for Nina. She is a young 23-year-old Russian and they do eventually get married the same year in 1917. They do have a baby boy who does pass in a couple of years. At this point, Kandinsky is now 51 years old. Furthermore, the political atmosphere of 1917 Russia has starting to have its toll on the artist. With his father passing around the same time, he's left with a large inheritance. Yet as Bolsheviks come into power, his inheritance is confiscated. That was the first time in his life where he's financially left with nothing. 
It's genuinely tough to imagine his state at this particular time. Luckily, his wife Nina was able to reignite his passion for art and creating. He began painting once again. He also starts working in the world of theater and film, followed by being invited to teach yet again, and he even helped found an institute of artistic culture in Moscow, and he was appointed its first director. Over the next three years, he helped open up 22 galleries across Russia and kept painting. Creating was like error to him. In this period of about seven years, he creates only 40 paintings. There are a few reasons for that. First, he was real busy with his other work, his teachings, other galleries, and unfortunately his health starts to dwindle as well. Yet we really start to see the direction that the artist chooses in his work. He chooses more organized, analytical compositions of his art, with the shape of the circle being the major focus in his work. And you know, he really gave a chance to the, his new circumstances, and he really tried, but he couldn't quite align his love of abstract art his values along with the politics. So in 1921, as abstract art was deemed unacceptable, it was really time to get going or completely radically change his way of painting. Around the same time, he gets invited to teach in Bauhaus, which is an art school in Germany. Nina and Kandinsky make their move to Germany quite quickly. No one really put any restrictions on what and how he should be teaching. So this period reignites his passion for art, for creating, for teaching, and he starts creating multiple works of art. He keeps on pushing the limits of artistic representation and what's possible from art. What are all the possibilities when it comes to geometrical shapes of circles, and triangles. In fact, if we are going to talk about a circle and triangle, Kandinsky often said the circle and the triangle meeting is basically equivalent to Michelangelo's touch. Around 1928, that's the same time that he gets his German citizenship. The Bauhaus school was famous for its novel approach for design with the concept of combining artistic vision along with everyday function. Unfortunately, yet again, the political tensions and climate of mid-twenties in Germany start to have its toll on the artist and the rest of the world for that matter. The Bauhaus school was criticized by the ultra-conservatists and after the right wing has won the political elections in 1924, the Bauhaus school was closed down. The school relocates to Dessau in Germany. From 1926 to 1933, Kandinsky continues teaching and painting nonstop, producing over 259 works of oil, over 300 pieces in watercolor, and, and many other types of different art techniques. Unfortunately, a lot of these pieces aren't saved from that time. Yet again, in 1932, due to political pressures, the Bauhaus school is set to close down again and the school moves to the outskirts of Berlin. And unfortunately, that period didn't last long either and next year the school was permanently shut down in 1933. After Hitler came to power, Kandinsky knew that he had to get going and move for multiple reasons. One of those reasons being that his art was yet again deemed unacceptable and prohibited. Kandinsky and his wife Nina moved to the outskirts of Paris, France. Here in France, he continues to work tirelessly and in big numbers, hoping to sell in masses. Unfortunately, that does not happen. Not one gallery showed any interest in showing his art. Financially, he was in dire situation and just was barely getting by with the remainder of his Russian inheritance. Putting poverty, misunderstanding of his critics, his poor health aside, Kandinsky still kept creating nearly every single day. In 1939, his Composition 9 was bought by Musée National d'Art Moderne. That same year, he gets a French citizenship. This incredible artist continued painting up until his last days in 1944, leaving behind tremendous work and passion for abstract movement 
which he called not to be the randomness of mind's work, but a natural result of art evolution. Thanks for watching guys. I really hope you enjoyed this video and this artist. Can't wait to come back with another artist for you guys next month. See ya.